Hello and welcome to this fourth example of first order system responses and again I'm assuming that you've been watching our previous videos we're going to jump straight in um, without much preamble to this fourth question which looks something like this a thermocouple has the transfer function linking its output in volts to its input theta in degrees Celsius um, of 30 times 10 to the minus 6 over 10 s plus 1. When the thermocouple is subject to a steadily rising temperature, um, input of 5 degrees uh, Celsius per second, what will be the thermocouple output after 12 seconds? So this example here is very similar to the previous example we've just looked at, which involves the same thermocouple, but whereas the previous example involved a step input, what we have here is going to take the form of a ramp input because the input is steadily increasing um, by five degrees Celsius every second. And so we have a ramp input, which in our previous videos as well, we've said takes the form of A over S squared in the S domain. And A is the gradient or rate of increase, um, which in our case is five, five degrees Celsius per second. And so in our case, we can say that theta i, our input um, temperature in the S domain, is equal to five over S squared. Again, like in our previous videos, we multiply the input by the transfer function in order to determine the output. So we have V O of S, the output voltage, in the S domain is equal to the input, which is a temperature input theta i in the S domain, multiplied by the transfer function G of S, again in the S domain. So nice and easy, hopefully, because we know the input now is five over S squared, and we're multiplying that by the transfer function, which we said was 30 times 10 to the minus six over 10 S plus one. And when we multiply uh, numerators and denominators, we get something that looks like this. Uh, which tidies up a little bit, we can um, simplify that, that numerator on the top as 15 times 10 to the minus 5 over s squared 10 s plus 1. Um, like we've done in previous examples, let's take that 15 times 10 to the minus 5, let's take that out of the fraction um, as a factor uh, so that the, the, the numerator of the fraction is 1. And hopefully the reason I've done that is um, clear if you've been following previous examples. We want some consistency between these two terms as they tend to match um, when we refer to entries in the table. But what we're also going to do is we're going to remove this coefficient here um, of 10, 10s. And to do that, we're going to divide these terms all by 10, top and bottom. So... 10s is now just s, and 1 on the top and on the bottom here, these are going to be now both 1 over 10. We've divided all those terms by 10. So at this stage, we have our function here, but unfortunately, it's another one of those examples where we are going to require the use of partial fractions, because what we have here, this fraction, doesn't clearly match any of the entries in our table of Laplace transforms to perform that inverse transform. And so what we're going to do is very similar to um, example two, a couple of videos back, we did something very similar with partial fractions. We're going to again go through the whole method of partial fractions here, but maybe a bit more um, quickly, a bit more briefly than we did in the previous video. But the idea being, we're going to take this fraction here, um, and we're going to expand that into something that looks like this we have three smaller, simpler fractions here. And each of these fractions has a denominator, which is a, a different possible factor of the original denominator. So we had s squared, s plus one over 10. So s squared is a factor of, of that denominator. s is also a factor, we could divide by s. And that bracket s plus 10 is also a factor um, to multiply together to, to get that original denominator. So we have these three sort of partial fractions set up but again we have these three unknown numerators we've just given them the names a b and c and the intention here is to work out what those 
those um, numerators actually are. So same method as last time in example two, we begin by multiplying both sides by the original denominator here, s squared, s plus 10, uh, s plus one over 10, sorry. And so if we multiply the left-hand side by that, we're just left with one over 10 on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we're gonna multiply each term. We have three terms. We've gotta multiply them all by that um, original denominator there. And we'll end up with something that looks like this. Again, for the case of each fraction, we'll see some cancellation. The s squared terms will cancel in this first fraction. Uh, the s term on the bottom here will cancel with um, the squared or the, one of the s terms in the s squared. And in the third fraction, the s plus 10 uh, bracket will cancel with, with the, the bottom as well here. And so when we simplify that down after all that, we end up with something that looks like this. And at this stage, we substitute different values of, of s, um, we substitute in different values for s to try and eliminate some of these um, unknowns, a, b, and c. So the first instance, what I'll do is I'll make s equal to zero. And if s is equal to zero, we'll go through this equation, all the, all the s's are now zeros. We see straight away that the, the whole b term is now zero, we're multiplying by zero, the whole c term is now zero, so they disappear and we're just left with 1 over 10 is equal to a times 1 over 10 and the 1 over 10s cancel, we're just left with a equals 1. Um, similarly, we can go to say that s is minus 1 over 10. Well, why have I done this? It's because when I put this into the fraction, uh, sorry, when I, when I substitute this fraction into the equation, every time we see an s, s is now minus one over 10. We see now these brackets here contain minus one over 10 plus one over 10. Well, minus one over 10 plus one over 10 is zero. So all of these brackets are going to cancel to zero. Uh, and that happens in two occasions here. So the a term is gonna be zero. The b term is gonna be zero. And so we're left with uh, 1 over 10 on the left hand side is equal to c times minus 1 over 10 squared and just a word of caution here minus well minus number squared gives you a positive number uh, 1 over 10 squared gives you 1 over 100 squaring the top and the bottom and so 1 over 10 is equal to c times 1 over 100 um, they cancel or you can multiply both sides by 100, but we get C equals 10. So now we know that C equals 10 and we know that A equals 1. The last thing we're going to do is we're going to set all of the S terms to 1 over 10. Just a sort of mirror image of what we used in the previous uh, instance of minus 1 over 10. So we now have S equals 1 over 10. Every time we had an S, we now have a one over 10. We see something that looks like this. And some of those will uh, simplify a little bit. One over 10 plus one over 10 in those brackets is two over 10. Um, and so we reduce it to something that looks like this. And one over 10 squared is just one over 100. So we end up with one over 10 equals A times two over 10 plus B times two over a hundred times uh, plus C times one over a hundred. We know already that A equals one and C equals 10. And so we can put those straight in and evaluate that a little bit. Uh, we end up with one over 10 equals two over 10 plus B two over a hundred plus one over 10. And we can subtract 2 over 10 um, from both sides, we can subtract 1 over 10 from both sides, we end up with now minus 2 over 10 on the left hand side, we had 1 over 10, we minus 1 over 10, which is now 0 on the left hand side, we're minusing another 2 over 10, uh, so we have minus 2 over 10 on the left hand side now, is equal to b times 2 over, one, two over 100, um, we can multiply both sides by 100, divide both sides by 2, we end up with b equals minus 10. 
So now we found the values of all of those three unknowns, A, B, and C. We can put them back into our original equation, uh, which looked like this, but now it looks something like this. We've taken that fraction, that was our original fraction on the left-hand side. We've expanded that into three um, smaller partial fractions, and we have the values of the numerators for each as well. So when we return to our original equation, remember it was just the fraction that we expanded, but if you recall originally, we took that factor of 15 times 10 to the minus five outside of that fraction, that's still there. Um, so whereas we started out with something like this, we've expanded it into now something that looks like this, but remember not to forget about that, um, that coefficient that we took outside, that factor that we took outside of that fraction, it's still multiplied by um, all of those that we've expanded there. So now hopefully the whole point of doing this is that we've made that fraction which was not found in our original table of Laplace transforms, we've, we've converted that into three simpler fractions that hopefully are. And if we return to our table of Laplace transforms, we see that one over s squared um, corresponds with a ramp function. Uh, 10 over s corresponds with a constant. This term here, 10 over s plus 1 over 10, well, I could express that, I'll just make a note to the side here, I could express that as 10 times 1 over s plus 1 over 10. And that 1 over s plus 1 over 10 corresponds with a decay function in our table here, not forgetting to multiply it by 10. And so what we can now do is we can um, take the, the inverse transforms in the time domain for each of those and substitute those back in to an equation in the time domain. So here my 15 times 10 to the minus 5 is untouched. The, the, Laplace, the inverse Laplace transform was only applied to those um, those fractions um, in the s domain, whereas that constant is just a constant, we can keep it as a coefficient outside of the Laplace transform. It's still here though, but those fractions in the s domain have now been converted into their respective um, functions in the time domain. We can tidy that up a little bit. We can say that, uh, well, 1t is just t, and um, e to the power minus 1 over 10t is the same as e to the power minus t over 10. So what we have here is our solution, um, which is correct. What, what I can also do is multiply out this bracket. Um, we have three terms in the bracket, t minus 10 and 10 e to the power minus t over 10. I can multiply each of these by... 15 times 10 to the minus 5. So the first term t here it would be my, uh, sorry, it'd be 15 times 10 to the minus 5 t. Um, the second term would be minus 15 times 10 to the minus 4 because I've multiplied it by uh, minus 10. And the third term, similarly, it's going to be multiplied by 10. Um, so it's going to be 15 times 10 to the minus 4 e to the minus t over 10. And then I can factorize or draw out a common factor of 15 times 10 to the minus four in these latter two terms and um, draw out that common factor. So it looks something like this, 15 times 10 to the minus five t minus 15 times 10 to the minus four brackets one minus e to the power minus t over 10. The only reason I've done this is to visualize something very quickly is that the response here resembles um, hopefully something we'll rep uh, recognize as a ramp function, 15 times 10 to the minus 5 t, any number t is a, a, a gradient with respect to time, so it's, it's a ramp function minus what we have here is a growth function. Um, we derive this e to the minus um, as a decay function in the table, but one minus a decay function is a, is a growth function. And so we have a, a growth function as our second term. So this response is actually a ramp minus a growth um, function in its, in its makeup here. 
Returning to the original question, though, we were asked what was the output voltage or the response of this system after 12 seconds. And so very simply, now that we're in the time domain, we can substitute for uh, time, um, replacing T with 12 in these instances here. And if we do that, we come up with an answer of uh, 0 0.00075171 volts, or better expressed as 751.79 microvolts for the voltage at 12 seconds. So I hope you found this video useful. Um, this has been the last example of a first order system response. Uh, we're going to look at more examples, another four examples, but they're going to be examples of second order systems as well.